From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Let me welcome you back to episode 130 of the Cannabis Podcast. If this is your first time visiting us, well, I hope you're going to enjoy the next 30 or 40 minutes of cannabis information and an especially warm welcome for you. Now, let me remind you, this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment and perhaps educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. In this episode, well, we've got a few things we're diving into. How about child-resistant cannabis packaging? Many of us would say it's actually senior and adult resistant packaging that's in cannabis. We have so much trouble opening it, but it is really important that we keep it out of the hands of kids. We have a story on that and why that's so important. You may have heard about Delta 8. It's a small cousin of Delta 9, the THC we get when we smoke our cannabis. It doesn't appear a lot in cannabis. It's a very small cannabinoid in terms of the amount that it's in the product, but it's showing up in products now because they're creating it. We're going to look at Delta 8 THC and see how we should be considering that in the future. Also, I guess this is not hard to believe. (laughs) With all the trouble we've experienced in the Canadian cannabis market, guess who the biggest creditor for many of our failed cannabis companies is? Yep, that's the CRA. (laughs) I have a story on that. You may remember earlier this year and perhaps into last year, we were talking a couple of products that brought some innovation into the industry. One of them was Jolt's some lozenges from the folks at Organigram, and they contained 10 milligrams per lozenge, and the packages contained 25 lozenges for 250 milligrams of THC in that package. And then we also had a product from Glitches from Aurora, and they had 10 milligrams per gummy and 10 gummies in the package for 100 milligrams in the package, when, of course, edibles are only allowed to have 10 milligrams of THC. Well, there has been some news in the Health Canada action over that event, A judge has declared that they need to rethink their decision. We have that story for you. And on Cultivar Corner, we are actually not sampling BC weed. (laughs) I know I tend to do a lot of BC weed on Cultivar Corner. This is some product from Alberta, and this is Galactic Glue from Virtue Cannabis. All of that and more on episode 130 of the Cannabis Podcast. And because the Cannabis Podcast does not occur in a vacuum... There is stuff happening in our world all the while we are producing this podcast. Today especially, there may be some smoke inside the studio as we prepare ourselves with a little cannabis enhancement, but unfortunately there's a lot more smoke outside of the studio. Located in the Okanagan Valley, and uh, right now there are three or four wildfires occurring virtually all around our city, and this valley is completely encased in smoke at the moment. I mean, totally encased. It's difficult to breathe if you go outside. It's that thick. So a lot of people staying indoors these days. Well, the last couple of days, thankfully, it's only been happening the last day or two. A lot of people evacuated yesterday. We actually closed our store early because our staff had to evacuate and we had to support them in that. It is a wild time, a wild time. Thanks so much to the firefighters, all the first responders that are out there diligently working. I don't know how those firefighters do it working those long, long shifts in that hot, hot heat. God, that's got to be a brutal environment. Thank you so much for the efforts that you put forth in it. Uh, We will get through that. I have no idea when this is going to end. This is still an ongoing story as we speak today. If you hear some planes and helicopters in the background, I may have missed that in, in editing the program. It's wild. My thoughts go out to everybody who has been impacted. There have been a number who have lost their homes. And a lot of other property damages. Fortunately, no human life as of this point has been lost in this fire. So that's fabulous news. My heart's with everybody who's had to deal with some of those issues. And let's hope it gets better soon. And now to our first story. We're going to go to Kenigma.com for this one. And it is why child-resistant cannabis packaging is so important. And this story was written by Cody Peterson. There are many benefits to cannabis edibles. They're tasty and discreet with long-lasting effects. But they're not without their drawbacks, especially in small and inexperienced hands. As a frontline pediatric pharmacist in a Southern California emergency department, I see accidental cannabis ingestion in small children at least weekly, if not more often. The advent of beautiful, delicious infused candies like gummies and chocolates 
has brought joy to countless cannabis consumers, but in the wrong small hands. Mishandling these sweet treats can lead to serious consequences. Legalization has led to an increase in pediatric ingestions. Numerous studies have found an association between legalization and the number of pediatric ingestions of THC-containing products, both intentional and unintentional ingestions, are on the rise. While it's possible that part of this increase is in the reporting of accidental ingestions is related to decreasing stigma around cannabis, evidence still suggests accidental ingestions are on the rise. With the intentional ingestions that go awry, it's usually an older child or teenager who takes too much and has a total freakout, accompanied by panic attacks, paranoia, and or erratic behavior. Other times, it's the parents who freak out. Unintentional Oedipus overdoses, on the other hand, usually occur in toddlers or young children, mostly by getting into their parents' or siblings' cannabis products at home. In the U.S., thanks to prohibition, every legal state, medical or recreational or both, has its own packaging rules and regulations. As a result, there's a lot of problematic packaging that's either too easy or too difficult to open, which can both be challenging depending on context. There are also claims that cannabis packaging often appeals to children, with bright neon colors and artsy cartoons. Likewise, products that imitate non-infused foods like Oreos, Doritos, or Skittles are another major issue in the illicit cannabis market. But there are more serious problems than the variation in laws from state to state. Many cannabis products are being sold with no regulation whatsoever. For example, it's estimated that there are still more illegal cannabis products being purchased in California than cannabis products. And to make things worse, these illicit products are not held to any regulatory standard, nor do they contribute to local taxes. Moreover, legal Delta-8 THC and other intoxicating hemp-derived cannabinoid products generally fall into this unregulated category. Because the process of producing these cannabinoids from hemp is not simple chemistry, scientists have raised concerns about the safety of these processes and the byproducts that are produced while converting CBD into THC. And as a sidebar, we will have another story later in this episode talking about one of those derivatives of Delta-8. End of sidebar. What happens when children accidentally eat edibles? A recent study in Canada found that in the four years since commercial cannabis edibles were permitted for sale, the rate of pediatric hospitalization for accidental ingestion doubled compared to the previous four years. THC-containing products are increasingly to blame for children showing up at the emergency department. And while serious injury or long-term effects from a one-off accidental ingestion is rare, there are side effects, and they can be very unpleasant. It's not uncommon for children to become so sedated that they are admitted to the hospital with concerns around their breathing or ability to maintain proper vital signs. As anyone who's eaten too much THC will know, side effects can vary widely, from dizziness and vomiting to sedation and stupor. In children, because of their small body size, a relatively small dose of THC can have strong effects. Serious side effects can include vomiting, severe lethargy, the inability to walk, blood pressure problems, slow breathing, confusion or agitation, and even seizures have been reported on rare occasions. To childproof something means to ensure that no child could ever gain access to it. A challenging task is getting into things is something kids thrive at. As such, packaging is rarely intended to be truly childproof, but instead just resistant to kids. Child-resistant packaging, as defined by the Poison Prevention Packaging Act, is designed to be challenging but not impossible for children under five years of age to open within a reasonable time while being accessible for adults. The general idea is it will take kids greater than five minutes to open and can be quickly opened by nine out of ten adults. In other words, child-resistant packaging aims to slow children down rather than completely prevent access. And while it has reduced unintentional poisoning deaths, supervision and proper storage remain essential. While many states have regulations on child-resistant packaging in retail settings, if you're making your own edibles, you need to take responsibility for your own child-proofing. It's one thing to leave cannabis flour accessible, as ingesting it before decarboxylation wouldn't be dangerous for children, because eating THCA doesn't get you high. But if you're making cannabis-infused goodies at home, a couple of stolen cookies from the wrong jar could make for a rough evening in the emergency department. To bring awareness to the issue, two Colorado-based brands are reminding cannabis consumers to safeguard their weed. Edibles producer Wanna Brands and cannabis storage brand Stash Logix purpose the following four simple steps. Buy products with child-resistant packaging. Store cannabis in a secure, lockable device. Place cannabis out of reach of children. And learn more about child-proofing from a free course. The bottom line is keep your edibles locked, well-labeled, and out of the reach of children. Kids will be kids, and kids love sweet treats. Stoners do too, but to be good stewards of the plant, we must be smart about where we store our edibles. The bottom line, keep your cannabis products locked and out of reach of children and well-labeled. Whether you're buying products with safe packaging or using your own storage device at home, you're doing the responsible thing and keeping your friends and family safe while still enjoying the benefits of cannabis edibles.
And that's a message we all need to pay attention to. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And for our next story, we're going to mjbizdaily.com and a story written by Matt Labors, who has written a lot of the stories we have covered. And this is all about Canada's federal government accounting for a growing share of the unpaid debts racked up by failed cannabis companies. Lending credence to claims the nation's nascent adult use industry is suffering from pricey fees and heavy taxation. A review of recent insolvency filings by MJBS Daily found that the Canada Revenue Agency, the Federal Tax Collection Body, and Health Canada, the national department in charge of regulating cannabis production, are commonly among the biggest unpaid creditors for insolvent marijuana producers. In the 2021-22 fiscal year, various levels of government collected more than $1.5 billion from the cannabis industry via excise tax, other taxes, and various fees, including the annual regulatory fee. However, the amount of unpaid federal excise tax and fees has skyrocketed. Licensed producers owed the Canada Revenue Agency $192 million as of March 31st this year, while unpaid regulatory fees jumped to almost $4 million. It's increasingly clear that for many cannabis companies, insolvency is the result of a formula where taxes and fees squeeze out such a big portion of the overall price, George Smitherman, CEO of the industry group Cannabis Council of Canada, told MJ Biz Daily. Fierce competition a glut of product, and falling wholesale prices are also weighing on the industry. The latest example of outstanding debts owed to the federal government is Vancouver, British Columbia-based cannabis producer Tantalus Labs. In June, Tantalus filed a notice of intent for restructuring in a British Columbia court. A review of Tantalus Labs' creditors list shows that the Canadian government accounts for more than half the licensed producers' unsecured debt. Of the $8.4 million that Tantalus owed to 92 creditors, $4.5 million was due to the Receiver General for Canada, the body responsible for accepting payments owed to the federal government. The producer also owed Health Canada $388,000. Together, the two government bodies make up 58% of Tantalus's debt, an indication that fees and taxes contribute a significant amount to cannabis business costs. The number of licensed cannabis producers unable or willing to pay their excise duty to the Canadian government has soared in recent years. Almost three-quarters of the 305 LPs required to pay the duty had an outstanding debt with the CRA as of March of 2023. Not all cannabis executives believe the excise tax applied to sales is unreasonable. Norton Singhaven, CEO of Kelowna, British Columbia-based Avant Brands, said the excise is fine and the industry should instead be targeting various fees levied by Health Canada, such as the annual regulatory fee. All the fees Health Canada scrapes along the way are where the potential savings are for businesses, Singhaven said in a phone interview. Singapore doesn't believe the excise tax is the cause for so many business failures. I think most of these companies have bigger problems, he said. For the vast majority, the excise tax doesn't change their financial situation. He noted that some cannabis companies are succeeding in the face of high fees and taxes. And noted the third quarter results of Canera Biotech, a Montreal headquartered cannabis producer, which reported positive free cash flow and net income for its third quarter. He also said his company, Avant Brands, reported positive free cash flow and a small loss for the recent quarter. It's still an early-stage industry. It's meant to be challenging, Singhaven said. It's meant to be hard. It's not a gimme. And that story from mjbizdaily.com on all of the money owed to the government. Another story from Kenigma.com today. And this, what is Delta 8 THC? And more importantly, is it safe? This is a story written by Matt and Wheel. What if there were a type of weed that was fully legal, safe to use, you could buy it at the corner store, and it wouldn't even show up in a drug test. Sound too good to be true? It is, unfortunately. Delta-8 THC, a close relative of the more famous Delta-9 THC, acts in many of the same ways, producing a similar high and even some of the same therapeutic effects. This compound is produced in very small amounts in marijuana and hemp, but most of what is on the market today is converted synthetically in a lab and sold in amounts largely unseen in nature. Because most Delta-8 products are derived from hemp plants, it is believed by some that they fall under a loophole in federal cannabis laws. It is also touted as natural and safe. But you should probably think twice, maybe even three times, before picking up some Delta-8. It's not really as legal as often suggested by producers and marketers. It's not at all clear how safe it is to consume. And despite claims to the contrary, it will most likely show up in a drug test. What is Delta-8 THC? The cannabis plant can produce a great number of active compounds. Those unique to cannabis are called cannabinoids. Roughly 150 different cannabinoids have been identified already, but the two most common and abundant are Delta-9-THC and CBD. 
Delta 9 THC and CBD can be found in concentrations as high as 20% and even 30%. But minor cannabinoids such as Delta 8 THC generally occur in concentrations below 1%. Delta 8 THC, like many other cannabinoids, was first identified by Roger Adams in the 1940s and further synthesized by Raphael Meshulam in the 1960s. And Raphael Meshulam is the one who discovered THC. Technically speaking, it's not produced by the plant, but it's rather a degradation product of Delta-9 THC, often as a result of aging and storage conditions. Interestingly, along with Delta-9 THC, Delta-8 is one of the few cannabinoids considered to be intoxicating. Most cannabinoids are psychoactive and have potential pharmacological properties, but getting you high isn't one of them. In fact, Delta-8 THC has been shown to be slightly less intoxicating than Delta-9 THC, with one study stating that it is two-thirds as potent. Because Delta-8 THC only occurs in minuscule quantities in hemp and marijuana, you're more likely to encounter synthetically produced Delta-8 infused products such as oils, tinctures, different types of edibles, and even dried cannabis flowers. Other than serving as a lighter version of Delta-9 THC, Delta-8 has also been researched as a potential treatment for a number of medical conditions and symptoms such as vomiting and nausea, glaucoma, pain, and inflammation. The vast majority of scientific knowledge is based on animal studies, however. It's often suggested that Delta HTHC is a naturally occurring compound that can be extracted from hemp, but in fact, it only appears in very small amounts in nature. According to Christopher Hudulia, the founder and chief science officer of Provert Labs, a Massachusetts-based cannabis testing company, out of 18,000 samples of hemp, 98.5% had no measurable concentrations of Delta HTHC. Of the ones that did contain Delta-8, the average concentration was only about 0.0018%. Although Delta-8 is naturally occurring in marijuana and hemp plants, yes, they are the same plant, Houdela told Seed and Stem earlier this year almost all of the Delta-8 on the market has been converted from CBD through a synthetic process. While there's at least one U.S. patent on a method for extracting Delta-8 and no shortage of YouTube tutorials demonstrating the process, it's not necessarily a good idea to consume such products. Unless it's being manufactured by a qualified company in a proper facility, the total lack of regulation means that anyone could be converting CBD into Delta-8 THC in their garage without any standards or oversight. It would be unwise to assume that just because Delta-8 products are available to purchase that they are safe. When it comes to safety, the two main factors to consider are production, standards and regulation, and research. With regards to production, there are no regulations or standards which means anyone can be making these products in their garage and distributing them with nice-looking labels in stores or online. Those labels mean very little, however, without reliable and regulated testing requirements. Maybe the label says there's no Delta-9 THC in the product, or it says there are only natural and safe ingredients. In a regulatory framework without standards or oversight, none of this matters. You have no way of knowing whether the label information is accurate. The issue has already been identified with CBD products in the past. And it's very likely that Delta-8 THC will show up in a drug test, but it depends on a few factors. There are different ways to test drug levels in your body, including testing your saliva, urine, blood, or hair. Of these, urine testing is the most common, and it actually tests for a THC metabolite, what's left from THC after it's processed in your body, named D9-THC-COOH, not the presence of Delta-9 THC itself. The most frequently used urine testing methods immunoassays are not very reliable and can produce both false positive and false negative results. A second method, gas chromatography slash mass spectrometry, is more accurate and is often used as a follow-up test to verify positive results from immunoassays. Unlike immunoassays that screen for a range of metabolites, however, the GCMS would have to look specifically for D8THCCOOH in order to detect it. So whether or not Delta-8 THC is to be detectable depends on the type of test used and on whether or not it is looking for D-H-T-H-C-C-O-O-H. So you can make your own decision about whether you want to follow down that Delta-8 path that has not appeared in a lot of products in Canada yet. It is coming soon. So be aware of that when you make your own decision. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me, cultivar corner. On Cultivar Corner today, may seem strange, but we're leaving BC. <laughs> I know we've done an awful lot of BC bud in Cultivar Corner over the months and years that we've been here. But I came across some bud from Alberta from a company called Virtue Cannabis. 
and decided it was time that we gave some Alberta Bud a little bit of a try. Oh, my, my, my. This is Galactic Glue. Now, Virtue Cannabis fairly new to the scene, and that's pretty evident when I go onto the website and I check their website, <laughs> and all I have is a Contact Us page. <laughs> No details on there, so I had to go elsewhere to find the details for Galactic Glue. Mmm, very, very nice. And it smells that nice because my terpenes are sitting at 4.5%. Mmm, so let me give you the details. This is from a strainy.ca, which I'd never heard of before, but I found this link. Galactic Glue from Virtue Cannabis. It's a sativa-dominant hybrid, which is good for today, because I'm into my weekend and ready to do a bunch of stuff today. Perhaps a nice round of golf would be nice, too. Galactic Glue is a sativa-dominant hybrid from Virtue Cannabis, bred from Gorilla Glue Number no. 4 and Original Glue. With terpenes like myrcene, beta-pinene, humulene, and limonene, the strain has a scent and taste of gas, earthy and sour. The effects include a body high, euphoria, and upliftment. Upliftment? I'm going to have to check that word out. <laughs> The terpene profile. Uh, on my bag, it tells me my terpenes are sitting at 4.5%. And do they? Oh, they do. Look at the back of the bag. They have done a nice job of identifying all of the various terpenes and all of the various cannabinoids. Myrcene is sitting at 17.2. Uh, uh, limonene, 4.8. Those are the milligrams, by the way, not percentages. Pinene at 3.02. Caryophylline, 2.97. Some guoline, 1.6. There's some humulene, some bisabolol, linalol, osamine, and other. And I always like when they have the other for the terpenes because it's often the biggest <coughs> amount. <laughs> so the total terpenes, 44.62 uh, gives me my terpene total of 4.6. So my THC on the galactic glue is 31.4. My terpenes are sitting at 4.5. Mmm, mmm. What are the common effects? Body high, euphoric, and happy and uplifting. Your aromas. There's definitely some gas. There's some earthiness, and there's a bit of sour tones in there too. Pull out one of these. Oh, very nice bud. Looks like a nice sativa bud. Eh, could have been trimmed a little bit better, if I'm being honest. And I guess what that's what Cultivar Corner is all about. Honesty, isn't it? So as I look at this fairly substantive bud, and yeah, I am going to say it could have been trimmed a little bit better. And this one bud is sitting at uh, 1.84 grams. And I do see a fair amount of sugar leaves that if I were in the trimming stage, I probably would have cut off. Nice aromas. Although not as big on the actual bud as I might like to have thought. I think I just hit the microphone there. I apologize for that if that's the case. And now i got my jewelry slip going and let's take a peek and see what we got on these. So again, yeah, the trim could have been a bit better, but not quite as tight as I would like to see. But then I have some of that same problem when I'm doing the curing of my own cannabis. What do we got for trichomes? I'm not seeing deep, vast trichome fields here. There's a bit of frost on the leaves. Definitely some red pistols in there. Dark green. Perhaps not as fragrant as I would have thought with terpenes at 4.5. But nonetheless, I think it's time we get something ready here. And we are going for a double banger today. I'm again going to use my Air Max for my vaporizer component. And we're going to roll a joint to get the other side of that component. So again, gas, earthy, and sour are my aromas. I'm going to pull a bit off of this big bud. I'm going to put that into my grinder. And let's see where we go to. So I have my Air Max warming up. I have my joint all ready to go. So I think it's time we give Galactic Glue from Virtue Cannabis a try. To recap, THC sitting at 31.4 and my Terps sitting at 4.5%. Total cannabinoids, 372 milligrams of cannabinoids in this puppy. So while that Air Max warms up, let's start the joint. This is Galactic Glue from Virtue Cannabis out of Edmonton. And just in time, my crafty is ready as well. So off of that joint, 
definitely some of those gassy and earthy notes coming in. Now, I have done my Air Max down to a temperature of 180, uh, where I'm hoping to get a bit more of the flavor out of this. So let's try the galactic glue from the Air Max. Mm. Okay, definitely more of the earthy, a bit of the sour notes when you pull it through the vaporizer. And those sour notes could likely be coming from the combination of the limonene and the pinene. Could be the caryophylline as well. The mercy is definitely supplying those earthy tones. Hmm. Like the taste in the Air Max. It's just so much smoother when you go through the vaporizer. A story featured on maybe this episode, perhaps the last episode. We talked about some better ways and more healthy ways to smoke your cannabis. And I think the most interesting thing out of that article I find is it blew away my concept of having to hold your breath when you take in a toke. Apparently that's all not all that necessary. <laughs> and that could be a lot of the reason for my coughing in some of my cultivar corners. So I'm taking a different approach. I'm just inhaling and then exhaling, not trying to hold that in my lungs. Okay, I haven't done the first bowl on the Air Max. As I say, it's a very small bowl, so I have to frequently change the bowl to put in some new weed. The real trick with the Air Max, as I've also discovered, is not to pack it too tight. <laughs> if it's packed too tight, it just doesn't pull really well, but when it's packed beautifully, mm, nice pull. Mm. And as I say, really liking that gassy notes. And that earthiness that comes along with myrcene is one of my favorite notes in cannabis. Just, you know you're getting high when you can taste that earthiness. Okay, so I am three or four tokes into this now, and I am starting to feel some euphoria in my endocannabinoid system. I'm going to crank up the heat just a little bit, see if I can get just a little bit more vapor. I'm going to take that up to 190 for my Air Max, refire the joint because I wasn't paying quite enough attention, I guess, and the joint kind of went out on me. Mm. Oh, there's some of that body high they talked about. Nice. Euphoric. Yeah, absolutely. That's coming on strong. Take the temp up a little bit. I get a bit more vapor out of the Air Max. A little less flavor, a bit more vapor. But I'm really, I'm quite happy with the Air Max and how it delivers from a vaporizer perspective. It's a nice addition to what I'm doing here on Cultivar Corner. Such a heavy duty battery on this sucker. It would last for days, I think. Body high, euphoric, happy, and uplifted. Well, I am sitting in a chair, so I haven't perhaps uplifted myself too much. <laughs> Uh, you know, when the corny jokes start to come out, then I'm probably getting buzzed. <laughs> the body high is there. The euphoria is there. Happy, uplifted, all feeling really good. So comments again. I'll pull out another bud here and see if I can see similar evidence of, of the trim. This is a slightly smaller bud. Okay, and I have to give them kudos on this one. This one has all of the sugar leaves trimmed off. That's a much tighter trim on that guy. Maybe it was just the first bud that I pulled out. <laughs> Somebody got a little lazy before they popped it into the bag. Okay, yes. I, <laughs> I am looking at the rest of the buds. And the trim is much better. So it just happened to be that the first bud that I pulled out of the bag <laughs> was one that they did late on a Friday night and perhaps didn't do as good of a job on trimming. <laughs> And when I say it's not as good, I'm, I'm being a little picky. 
because as you know, I try to give you my full real evaluation of what the weed does for me and how it looks. And on that bud, it was a little sloppy in the trim, but the rest of the buds, no sloppiness whatsoever. Really nicely trimmed. So Virtue Cannabis, their galactic glue, giving me a buzz. Yes, it has. I am euphoric, definitely feeling happy and uplifted. My head is just feeling really great right now. That body high coming on nice and strong too. This is nice weed and a nice effect. 31.4% THC, terpene sitting at 4.5, a very pleasant high. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm off to do some traveling around the galactic sphere. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And we go to CannabisLifeNetwork.com for our next story, which is Health Canada being ordered to review the organogram case. A federal judge has ordered Health Canada to review its organogram case over what constitutes a cannabis edible. Earlier this year, Health Canada sent cease and desist letters to LPs. They accused the licensed producers of selling cannabis edibles masquerading as extracts. Organogram was one of those LPs. Health Canada said their lozenges, known as jolts, were really edibles. This decision put the product under a different regulatory umbrella, namely a cap of 10 milligrams of THC per unit. So Organogram contacted their lawyers. Justice Cecily Strickland ruled that Health Canada was wrong. The federal health bureaucracy will have to review its initial decision and reassess. Of course, Health Canada can determine that its initial decision to classify lozenges as edibles was correct, and then we're back to square one. But right now, it's Organogram 1, Health Canada 0. It's music for our ears to hear a federal court order Health Canada around. But as mentioned, Health Canada could make the same decision regarding the Organogram case. The federal court also didn't address Organogram's main complaint. Health Canada made this decision after approving the lozenges as extracts. Jolts have been on the market since August 2021. It wasn't until early 2023 that Health Canada decided to flex their bureaucratic muscles. Justice Strickland did not rule on the reasonableness of Health Canada's compliance letter. She said there was a breach of procedural fairness with its initial decision. Ergo, return to the drawing board and see if you screwed up. Only in government can people investigate themselves for any potential wrongdoing. Organogram wanted the court to annul Health Canada's extract edible decision, so this is only a partial victory. The Health Canada Organogram case is important for several reasons. An already struggling cannabis industry shouldn't have to wage these battles over the petty attitudes of cannabis regulatory bureaucrats. A cannabis product labeled an extract can have 100 times more THC than an edible. Bureaucrats shouldn't be handing out cease and desist letters at the 11th hour. That's not how healthy Western democracies work. That's how banana republics work. Nobody wants to invest in a country where bureaucrats interpret public health and safety as interfering with consensual capitalist acts between adults. Organigram wasn't harming their customers by selling jolts, and customers weren't being duped or harmed by voluntarily buying the product. Health Canada is chasing a boogeyman, or perhaps this entire ordeal was plain old bureaucratic inefficiency. And that's really true. In terms of the customers, the jolts, the glitches, everybody was loving them, and they're all unhappy that they're no longer on the market. So, as they said, Organigram 1, Health Canada 0. Let's see how the next match ends. I realize that I have not spent any time so far in this season of the Cannabis Podcast talking about my grow. Well, it's time to change that. We were a little delayed this year because, of course, I did have the trip to Australia to visit my daughter and my granddaughter. So we were delayed until, well, the end of May. Usually we have would have germinated our seeds probably in, in, in what, March? Yeah, probably in March. Get them in the ground as May hits. Uh, well, that didn't happen until, when would we actually put them into the ground? They hit the garden on June 16th. So that's a late period for us. In our four plants this year, what am I doing? I'm doing autoflowers again because I just really like the size of the autoflowers and the fact that they do not need a light cycle so I can get from seed to harvest in about three months. And this year it is Acapulco Gold. I'm doing two seeds of the Acapulco Gold and I'm doing two of the Aurora. Acapulco Gold, of course, a sativa. Uh, always been one of my favorite strains. And Aurora, which is a cross of Northern Lights and Afghan, so a real nice indica. Uh, went into the ground June 16th, and they started flowering almost four weeks later. 
uh, July 18th, when we saw the first buds. And since they both have a 9 to 11 week flowering cycle, that means it's going to be sometime in September, near the end of September, by the time they are finally finished. And I have to say, I'm <laughs> surprised by that. Because <laughs> I was out looking at the plants this morning, and the buds, oh, they are really chunky already after four weeks of growth. And I can't imagine how fat they're going to be after another five weeks. But I'm going to try to be patient. I don't want to pop them too early. I haven't done any investigation as far as trichomes yet. I figure it's still far too early for that. But I think I'm going to take a peek. Because there's a couple that I'm thinking they're getting pretty heavy and pretty weighty. I might have to support them, in fact. But so far, I'm really pleased with how they're growing. We trained them as we have done with our autoflowers for the last few years. And so I've got a fair amount of product on each of those plants. There's probably seven or eight colas that are developing on each of them right now. And uh, many more in the inside. Really nice, chunky. I, I love the size of them. They're growing really well. I'll keep you informed as the harvest happens, probably a month or so away, before we start popping those down and putting them into the dry cycle. Always have some fun growing the cannabis. We are using refertilizer, a fertilizer uh, again this year. That could be one of the reasons why our buds are so chunky. Uh, looking forward to the harvest. And again, I'm probably about a month or so away. And I will share those details when we get there. Let me thank you for being a listener of the Cannabis Podcast. I so appreciate that you were here. It really matters to me. Let me also give out some shout outs to some of my supporters. To Kevin. And Jordana, supporting me at buymeacoffee.com slash Cannabis Podcast. If you feel so inclined and want to buy me a doobie, you can do the same by going to that address. Also, thanks to Tony, Roger, and once again, Rob, being patrons on Patreon. And you'll find the links to both Patreon and the Buy Me A Coffee Cannabis Podcast link in the top right when you're on the show page. I thank you so much for your support. If you ever have a comment on anything you hear, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. That's it for episode 130 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the cannabis-infused studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Are you looking for the next great cannabis business to invest in? Then you need to check out the MJ Bulls podcast. Hi, I'm Dan Humston. Join me each week as I speak to both cannabis entrepreneurs who are raising capital and cannabis investors who are investing capital. Our 10-minute episodes are perfect for the busy investor. Start listening to the MJ Bulls podcast today, wherever you listen to podcasts, and who knows, maybe you'll discover the next cannabis unicorn.